Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the No Man's Dream. Uh, my name is Adam Hartel, and I'm going to be your host today. Um, we have got a great show in store today. Um, we were actually just watching the um, the Noman 2020 student reel, um, and that's a collection of all student work from our school. Uh, those of you who are already familiar and are you know veterans on the stream here, welcome back. But for those of you who are just finding us today, welcome to the Noman Stream. Noman is a 3D art school located in Hollywood. And we are training artists for careers in uh, animation, games, and VFX. And so all of the, that you just saw on the reel there uh, preceding uh, the beginning of the stream is our student work. That is what we are teaching artists to do. Um, I'm joined today in the chat uh, on all the platforms we're streaming on today, Facebook and YouTube included, as well as Twitch, uh, by uh, Xander, our, one of our admissions advisors. And he's available to answer questions. Um, regarding anything regarding Noman, and he is also going to be helping to bring your questions for our guest through to me so that I can address them live um, on the stream. So with that, guys, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Today, I'm really excited. We get to have a conversation with Kyle Brown, a concept artist uh, who has uh, worked for years in the entertainment industry. Um, he is also a graduate of Noman. We're going to be talking about creature design and, and some of the work and projects that he's done. We're also going to talk a little bit about 
the, the class that he teaches here at Nomen in creature design. Um, so it's a chance for you as well to hear a little bit about what the classroom experience is like. And that's kind of the intent behind some of these streams that we've been doing with um, some of our instructors here at Nomen, as well as uh, staff here at the school. Um, we want you to have the opportunity, even though we're all social distancing, we want you to be able to kind of take a peek inside Nomen, see what the classroom is like, meet some of the people who would be training you if you were here, um, and some of the people that would be providing you mentorship and adding to your student experience. So with that, guys, I'd like to introduce our guest um, and just share a little bit about his bio with you. Kyle Brown brings his dynamic style and energetic presence to teaching at Nomen, from designing creatures for some of the biggest upcoming science fiction and fantasy feature films in the industry. A product of Nomen's entertainment design track, Kyle's background is an illustration for games, film, and industrial design. His credits include A Wrinkle in Time, as a creature designer, Ghostbusters, working in creatures and props, Ready Player One, working in creatures, characters, and vehicles, The Predator, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows, including many, many more. We're gonna see some of his work here on the stream. But with that, I just wanna say, Kyle, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, thanks, Adam. Thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. You know, it's a pleasure to be here, as always. Absolutely. So yeah, thanks for giving giving the time today. I'm actually I've been excited to do this stream, you know, because I'm in my second class with you at Nomen currently. Oh, um, we've been having a great time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I think just kicking it off, um, I wanted to ask you just a little bit, Kyle, about you know your artistic journey. Uh, maybe you could tell us, you know, just a little bit about you know where your art journey before you first started studying at Nomen. Um, and kind of how how you found your way into what it is you want to be doing as an artist. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, um, well, art, I mean, I think uh, I'm one of those fortunate people that I knew what I wanted to do from a very early age. And uh, that can be a double-edged sword um, because once you know, it's, it's all a matter of, uh, you know, how do you get there? But uh, I'm sure we'll talk more, <laughs> more Star Wars. It'll, it will inevitably come up today, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, one way or the other, I know you're rocking your Mandalorian shirt today and you got your storm uh, over your shoulder. One so. week, we're one week out, man. I can't Absolutely. Wait <laughs> yeah. Get the countdown. But uh, um, you know, for me uh, it was, finding I, I always loved drawing and drawing dinosaurs you know i loved jurassic park from when it came out in 1993 and then um came across star wars you know on television i was kind of one of those I, i'm one of those rare fans that i came in during the dark times during the dark period between uh <laughs> trilogies the original and the prequel trilogy and um it was really thanks in, in large part to uh the resurgence resurgence with the special editions so they re-released the art of star wars books um, of the original trilogy, and that's where the light bulb went off, and it was, oh, someone has to design all these characters and creatures that I, I, I love, you know, and just pop up on screen, someone actually had to think it out, so I thought, well, I love to draw, and I, I love movies and watching movies, so that's the intersection where I can, you know, uh, be a part of, and, um, you know, my my folks, my family, everyone was so wonderful in, in supporting, my, my mom's also an artist, so, you know, following that path, uh, um, certainly helped. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I studied at the um, and graduated from the Columbus College of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. uh, some other, uh, you know, very talented concept artists have come out of there. But uh, I, I saw a sort of senior show uh, with with guys like Brian Matthews and, and, and Kenji Bliss and Eric Spray. Um, who who were doing this really beautiful concept where I said, well, if they're doing that here, that's what I want to do. And and I, uh, they, they, I had a wonderful sort of undergraduate program, really focusing on you know the fun ma uh, fundamentals of, of illustration and, and design as a whole. And then after graduating, I thought, well, you know, there were just a few sort of uh, gaps or holes in, in what I felt were my, you know, uh, academic, uh, you know, or my academics or more of the technical side. And Nomen was always on my radar. Um, you know, I, I still remember, I think I traded a book to another student for the Ryan Church Nomen Workshop, uh, okay, DVD, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it, because resources weren't as readily available for those of you guys in the chat, you probably, you know, it, it early aughts or mid aughts. Um, you know, we had conceptart.org, you know, a few online um, uh, platforms like Control Paint and, of course, magazines like Imagine FX. But it was it was a bit piecemealed. It's not really like it is now with with these incredible resources and obviously the Nomen Workshop with this huge online library. It's this, it's this really beautiful Netflix esque you know, uh, uh, platform for everyone to learn from. Um, so I, I decided to come out here uh, to California to really pursue you know, to get even more serious about getting into entertainment design. And, and Nomen was an absolutely pivotal 
um, element in, in getting mm -hmm. here. I, I, I owe a huge uh, uh, thanks and gratitude towards Noman for really helping me uh, bridge that gap and, and find myself in this career. Cool. Well, let's let's unpack that a little bit more. We could jump back to like, because I'm always curious to hear what, um, especially working artists today, what was your high school experience like? I mean, you already knew what yep. you wanted to do, um, but you know, uh, what were you kind of what were you pursuing while you were in high school as an artist? What kind of stuff were you making? So, high, you know, it, with high school, it was it was personal projects, and you know, it, it was funny, and, and I'm sure as a lot in the chat, if if you're a high schooler right now or you're think close to graduating or you know. Uh, approaching that college, kind of college period of your lifetime, you know, I, I think it is a big question mark about where do you focus? And, and we had a really nice art program um, in, in the, the city I grew up in and especially the high school I attended. Uh, but, you know, it was the foundational stuff. It was, you know, it was doing still lifes and color pencil and, and clay and all that stuff. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, the science fiction horror stuff that I love drawing. I had to do that in my notebooks, <laughs> you know, during uh, during math class. Naturally. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like I, like on my own time. But, uh, uh, you know, I think it, it, here again, it's all about those foundational skills. So it gave me sort of a, a wide array of uh, mediums to play with. And I had some very supportive teachers, but, um, you know, as my, my folks will attest, you know, I, I definitely had that senioritis in, in high school and wasn't really taking it as seriously as they hoped I would. But, you know, finally kind of, uh, uh, you know, it kicked in and, and I really started to focus on kind of what I wanted to do, uh, you know, school wise to, to kind of, you know, figure out what I was going to do career wise. But, you know, high school is, you know, most of us feel, you know, it, it is you're a bit scatterbrained. You're trying to figure out what you're going to do. You got those big life questions. So, um, you know, for me, it was just trying to take in as much information as, po as possible. And I, I wasn't the best artist, you know, with a school like this, you know, everyone assumes, you know, oh, well, you were the best artist in school. You were the art kid you went through. But that, that was hardly the case. I mean, I was looking at guys far more talented, um, you know, th than myself or that what I would hope I, I would be. So it was really, you know, at that point, it was a it was definitely a, a life lesson, learn lesson and said, well, that's where I want to be or that's the level I want to get to. So it really pushed me to, you know, to up my game. Absolutely. And then, um, you know, you so you you went to art and design school in Columbia. Mm -hmm. And Columbus. Um, yeah, Columbus, sorry. Columbus, yeah. Uh, and, you know, th that was was that a lot of your like foundational stuff that you learned, like when it comes to like, I mean, what did you study there? It was. So my my degree is actually in illustration, which, mm -hmm. you know, covered everything from, you know, periodical illustration and yeah. um, game art and all the way up, you know, through comic book illustration and design. Um, the biggest thing, and I think maybe it was just, you know, in, you know, being in Columbus, Ohio, we weren't necessarily close to the industry. So sort of it was a lot of me kind of anticipating what I thought concept design would be. So, sure. um, uh, but no, obviously, and, and we'll, we'll talk more about my class later on, but the, I, I picked up a lot of the, the skill set that I, I feel was a, a beautiful marriage with what then I ended up pursuing at Nomen, which was mm -hmm. that, you know, the technical execution, the more industry specific, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, uh protocols and, and, you know, pipelines that, you know, I would implement working in, in, in this field, um, and then kind of fusing those together. So I would say it was absolutely one more grounded in sort of the traditional design principles that, you know, I use every day. Cool. And then, uh, so, you know, no, at Noma, we got a lot of, we've got a lot of students that come from, um, overseas. We've got a lot of out of state students, um, you know, and these are students that are having to make a pretty big move. That's a pretty significant change. I think anybody from outside LA coming to LA is a culture shock. So what was it like for you, like seeing this school over on the West coast and being like, I got to make this move. I got to go do that. Oh yeah. It is, it is daunting. And I always tip my hat. I mean, I moved 2,500 miles across the country, but I can only imagine for those students that are here from, from, you know, from Asia or Europe and, you know, other parts of the world where I go, wow, that's, that's a really incredible travel to leave your family and in, in, in a country, you know, and stuff, you know, it's one thing to move across the U S another thing from around the world. Um, you know, it was, it was a big move and it was a, a monumental shift in my life, especially when I knew that clock was ticking down. And I, you know, I, I had some time between college and Noman where I saved up money to move out here to make sure I kind of had a little nest egg to live off of and, uh, because I, I really wanted to make my, uh, make Noman or my time at Noman, my main focus and stuff. And I was fortunate that, you know, I was able to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but yeah, the move it was, you know, in, in California and you're coming from the Midwest, it is, it is a shift, but you know, what, what Noman offered was an incredible uh, environment, ecosystem and, and group of people that were really warming and very welcoming. So I, I have found, I know I found some lifelong friends, you know, during my time at Noman and, and, you know, peers within this industry that I talk to on a daily basis. So, um, you know, it, it was a shift, but you know, if you, if you're, if you can't imagine yourself doing anything else, you know, um, there are, there are worse places to be. So I, I think, uh, <laughs> even though it was a shift, um, you know, it ended up, it was a good one. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, as we're kind of going through your journey here, what was your time at Noman like? I mean, we just uh, had the pleasure last week of speaking with Jared Morantz, who is one of your instructors at Noman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now you're, you're also an instructor at Noman. But as a student there, uh, what was it like for you? Oh, I mean, it, it was incredible. I mean, uh, just the schedule wise, and it really felt you know, this was really the first time I was out on my own and, um, you know, not being, uh, you know, really being responsible for my time and in, in the work that I was producing, but the time at campus on campus, I mean, it just, it was really incredible, really energizing. I mean, I, I loved, I love being on campus. I love the events and stuff. I mean that, um, you know, uh, th that to me, it was just, I mean, it was like it was a, every other Friday. It felt like there was some incredible gallery opening or, or talk mm -hmm. that I would have pinched myself to be at. I mean, I remember being back in Columbus and there was the art of Avatar talk. And I literally considered buying a plane ticket to to come out just to <laughs> just to see that talk. You know, yeah. um, and of course, it sold out uh, quickly or every, t you know, seat was, uh, you know, uh, occupado. Um, so then when I was here. It was like just talk after talk, and 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 obviously getting to know my uh, you know great group of friends here and stuff that I kind of went through uh, the 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 track with. Um, I think that was that was a huge thing too, and just having that support structure around and people that you're going through with it. Because for current students, sorry guys, some background noise there. No um, you know, for for current students or people thinking about it, it's like you are in the thick of things with one another. So it's an incredible support structure, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I owe a huge, huge thanks to them and and, uh, and the faculty. I mean, Andrea Adams, I mean, I, I, I can't tell everyone enough or sing her praises enough. I mean, I love her. She instrumental in, in, in encouraging and in, in for, for where, you know, I ended up and stuff. So, uh, no, I mean, I, I can't I can't sing its praises enough, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, and, really and just for those who might not be familiar, um, because I, I'm, I'm familiar with Andrea and, and she has a tremendous reputation as an instructor at Noman. What were, what were the, the class or some of the classes that you took with her while you're here? I felt like everyone. <laughs> I mean, Andrea, I don't know when the, I don't know when the woman sleeps because uh, I had, um, uh, I think it was because I think it was film history, it was storyboarding, it was zoological. I had um, actually the current class um, I teaching as well as creature design is character development, which is typically a class that Andrea teaches when class is in session on campus. And of course, mm -hmm. because of COVID, we are we are online. So we kind of shifted some things around so that it was a little bit more online friendly, but still kept the spirit of the class alive. Um, but yeah, I'm sure I'm missing three, four, maybe a dozen other oh, classes that I had sure, with sure, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, those were just obviously, because they aligned obviously with, um, uh, with my interests, but you know, even like storyboarding, for instance, you know, I liked it because it paralleled some of the comic book interests that I had and stuff. But there was a there was a moment there where I was like, oh, I might actually pursue this because it was taught mm. in such a way, you know, it taught in a way where I was like, oh, this might be something I, you know, I, I carry forward with. And I really love that she gave that education um, to that side of things so that I could speak that language when we when I got, in, you know, into the studio setting. Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah. and it. I like I had creature design with you, I think a couple of terms ago, which is an amazing class. I mean, a really, really good class, Kyle. It made a, made a massive difference for me. Um, but now I have the pleasure of, of being in that class that you're teaching now. Um, you, I think you're sort of you're take, helping take care of it uh, with with Andrea or for Andrea. And uh, yeah, character development has been awesome. Just a great deep dive into really thinking about your character and what motivates them and who they are. And um, so for those of you who um, are just now learning about Noaman, I just wanted to have a quick aside and mention, you know, just like Kyle, you know, all of our instructors are working industry professionals. So that's one of the really exciting things about being in class is that you're not just hearing about the industry or hearing about techniques for the industry. You're actually learning to do the stuff that your instructor is doing every day in the industry, uh, which does make a difference. 
Um, and I think the other thing you touched on, Kyle, it's good to mention too, is that you, absolutely, we, I think when, uh, when the pandemic hit and we needed a social distance and we need to close down the campus, which we are, you know, hopeful as, you know, as, as things change, we hope they change quickly and we're able to reopen, but we are hundred percent online, which means mm -hmm. all of our full-time programs are online. We've got students starting from out of state online. Um, who will eventually move out here when the campus opens up. We've also got all of our individual classes and this is a custom built platform guys um, where you're getting, we made it very, uh, it was very important to us that you get the same kind of experience and interaction with your instructor and your peers in the classroom online as you would be getting in person. Um, and I can tell you just from taking some of Kyle's, Kyle's classes online, it's a, it's been a great experience. So. Uh, that was just a quick bit of information for those of you who might not be aware. Um, so let's let's talk about you know launching from Nomen um, as we start to get into some of your professional work and some of the things you did. So can you tell us what it was like finishing up at Nomen and then kind of looking out there at the wide world and looking for your first um, you know job as you built your career? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a bit daunting, and 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 like I said, like anyone going through this, you know especially for concept design, because it might feel like it's a smaller, you know, or finer needle to kind of thread um, uh, just because uh, of the positions or the availability or just kind of how you kind of break into it. Um, so for me, uh, there was a little bit of time, um, you know, where once I was done with, you know, uh, what I felt was the end of my path at, at Noman, and it wasn't, I actually ended up coming back and taking character development. So I kind of kept my one foot in or taking classes all a cart as I was able to and stuff. Um, and then I had chances to kind of back uh, weave back in and out with uh, those that I had gone through the term with, which was fantastic. Uh, but after Noman, um, you know, I took some more, uh, some additional classes, took a ZBrush class um, and um, really just worked on building a portfolio that was geared towards the kind of work that I wanted to do and, you know, the studios that I wanted to be at. So it was a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, reflection time and, you know, saying, looking at the bank account and say, <laughs> that is, that's dwindling, you know, and uh, I remember thinking I, I was, I was prepared to kind of go get a, you know, just kind of a part-time job to make things end, um, ends meet while I continue to work on my portfolio. And um, a call came in from ILM actually, wow. which I mean, is, is a dream come true. And I think, um, it, it, I, you know, I believe that was, a uh, was, was Shannon Wiggins, you know, at, uh, at, uh, at, at Noman, uh, who uh, was uh, sort of outreach and, and placement, who was kind enough to put me in touch. It was something to do with their their art department, but more of like an intern level or helping kind of, uh, you know, get, collect data or files and research for some of the other artists, but it was a foot in. So I went up there and interviewed and stuff, but then some things got shifted around. So it was a, it was a tease, but it, it was it was kind in the sense that it, it was just enough reassurance to say, okay, well, I'm on the right path. And then, you know, I found myself at my, you know, a previous studio and it was there for, you know, five plus years. And um, yeah. And then and the rest was, was history. I came on as an intern and then a staff artist, but uh, uh, you know, it, it can't feel a bit daunting because you feel like you, you know, you, it, you collect all this information, you talk to other artists, you talk to peers, you go, okay, well, what do I need to break in? And, um, you know, and, but I think it really just comes down to utilizing all those things that you have at your, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, within reach to, to kind of, you know, no, answer those questions for you and stuff. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And then um, I'm going to just share my screen here because as we kind of jump into some of your professional work, I want to be able to show some of your artwork, which is, which is really fun. Um, so yeah, so you're out there and you're working. Do you want to kind of just give us a little bit of, I mean, I, you don't have to like talk about every slide. The slides are just kind of running in the oh, background, sure. <laughs> but you know, talk sure. to us a little bit about, you know, out there, um, you know, building, building your career as an artist. Um, what are some of the highlights that you want to share with us? Yeah. So like even this guy here, this little Vungus, um, I mean, this was, this was great because, you know, I was in studio at the time and, uh, uh you know, working alongside buddies like uh, David Masson and, and, and Jared Krzyzewski, who's another instructor at, at Noman and Steve Sue. Um, uh, everyone's kind of since gone um, different ways, but uh, 
onto really big and, and fantastic things. So like onwards and upwards, they're really, really crushing it. Uh, but this is great. Cause I mean, it, it was it, these, a lot of these pieces reflect a lot of collaborative efforts. You know, uh, this design certainly doesn't happen in the void. Uh, here we see, this was uh, from a really fantastic uh, studio thingergy run by Frank Ippolito. So if you guys are familiar with the sci-fi show face off, uh, Frank was a contestant on that series a couple of times and he has his own shop up here in Burbank. Um, so he invited me on. I've been on a few different projects um, with him and including Umbrella Academy. So here you see AJ Carmichael for this most recent season of uh, Umbrella Academy. And this was a real thrill because not only was it design, it was the th 3D uh, sculpt or model and uh, uh, fabrication. So mm -hmm. they were actually That's cool. painted in. Yeah, so it was a one-to-one -one translation too. And then of course some CG um, elements in there too. So this was really a fantastic show. So, uh, you know, once I started working, you know, there were other opportunities that started to pop up. Yeah, here were some kind of far out designs for, um, uh, I think we did these in tandem with ILM, uh, kind of outsourcing as a vendor for uh, the Netflix film Bird Box that I know came out a couple of years ago. Of course, you don't see anything in the film, but we did conceptualize the idea of some of these um, the creatures or whatever they are, spirits, aliens. I'm not sure if they really say in the, in the film, but, um, yeah, I mean, there were, you know, at the previous studio, I mean, we really had a fantastic opportunity to work on a wide array of projects and, um, you know, things certainly didn't go stale on us. That's for sure. We, we definitely, <laughs> uh, uh, we kept, kept us on our toes and here is a, um, a really cool project that uh, I was very fortunate to be a part of, which was uh, the Birds of Prey or Harley Quinn, the Birds of Prey or the <laughs> the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Wh whichever uh, length of title exactly, you have. Uh, yeah, exactly. It depends on how much time you've got. So yeah. this was for uh, Black Mask, uh, Ewan McGregor's character of Black Mask um, seen uh, briefly at the end. And then I think this got handed back off to Warner Brothers and another artist kind of uh, finished up some of the effects, but kind of playing with this idea of like this high fashion uh, version of the Black mask design but ultimately it is something that's kind of a hybrid of the different ideas mixed with you know a look that's very popular of his from i think the arkham series mm -hmm. so uh yeah and this little dude uh is uh i think uh, just one of the brief concepts you know sometimes uh you know I'd, i was i'd jump on a show and maybe get to do one or two pieces um i mentioned steve sue before uh he did a, a beautiful job uh kind of working up the final designs for some of these aliens. This is for a project uh, called Captive State that I believe came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. cool. Uh, I think, was this from the same project or is this a different This project? is from a different one. So this is um, yeah. a show, I believe this was for Daybreakers, which was a, a Netflix right. series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just kind of a gooey, <laughs> really nice, I love, gnarly. I love the breakdown here. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to yeah. throw that in there because this is obviously part of the design, and I'm sure Adam and I will talk about this more, and we talk about this in in, in great depths uh, in class as well. But, you know, design, it is exploration, so it's not just about that sort of one image. Of course, we want to make it look beautiful, you know, and, of course, the bar just keeps getting raised higher and higher. Each project or every art book you buy, you go, oh, wow, like... You know, I mean, yeah. it's like that's fine art. I mean, that's gallery work these these artists are churning out. So you do want it to look cool, and and having it look cool obviously sells the idea behind the, the piece. But um, you know, sometimes it just comes down to breakdowns. So you can see these are just very simple ZBrush renders and just progress shots to kind of show, um, yep. you know, the production how this effect could work. Well, and I love these kind of images too because I think a lot of times, um, you know, I think when people who haven't yet necessarily worked for or in a studio concept art think about concept art and they imagine these really you know beautiful images and illustrations that you might see you know on art station or in people's instagram feeds and that kind of thing and and, and there is there is some of that in there but a lot of it's like this kind of stuff you know you got to yep. break it down or you got to do like 15 iterations or 50 iterations of the same character um while i thumb through a few more slides um just because we kind of you mentioned zbrush um you know you 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 got a degree in illustration and then you came to Noman and you also learned you added 3D yep. to your skill set. Yep. It kind of sounds like you use Noman as like a finishing school, right? Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what what is it like for you? Um, because you and I know that you move in between, you move from 2D to 3D yep. and back again. Can you talk about the relationship between uh, being a 2D artist and also learning uh, things like sculpting digitally in ZBrush? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's one, there's one pivotal class in between that kind of bridges the gap and um, a kind of a staple of Noman is John Brown and his sculpture class. And I know there's been some shifting around, of course, with, uh, I'm not sure how it's handled now with us being remote, but 
um, you know, I wasn't much of a sculptor. In fact, any of my classes that I had, whether it was toy design or just traditional sculpture in, uh, uh, in undergrad, they were horrendous. I was a horrible sculptor. <laughs> you know, I, I was like, I was a drawer, but I was hurt. Like uh, I said, Oh, if you can draw, you can sculpt. And I thought, well, I've yet to see the, <laughs> the evidence of that. I'm trying, but it's not happening. Uh, but it was really with John's class and he, he mm, broke down the yeah. forms and, and just thinking about things structurally and, you know, in tandem with, you know, a class like Mark's like VizCom class where, I started to put all these things together and think about things a little bit more geometrically or thinking about the, the surfaces and how I could chisel away. So when I got into uh, uh, ZBrush, which I'll give credit to Justin Fields, it was a ZBrush class I took uh, with him, uh, where it was an introduc uh, introduction to ZBrush, but taught in a way that really allowed me to just kind of jump in. And, and, and ZBrush definitely is its own thing. It's its own entity, but it just felt like a natural sort of evolution of those traditional skill sets. So I was able to take sort of what I would do in, in, in drawing or, you know, or painting, and then just kind of move it into this 3D form and, and finding that I could bridge a, that gap pretty yeah. easily. So, and that's large part, thanks to the, you know, the ease of the program. And, and like I said, classes like John Brown sculpture classes as well. Oh yeah. And John takes you through the paces. I've talked to him about how he, <laughs> how he works with his students. Yeah. And it really, you know, it requires dedication, but I think it's, it's really to the point of like, you know, um, none of this is easy. You know, none of this is coasting, but I think if you love it and you're passionate about it, putting in the work, you can actually improve at something. Oh, absolutely. Oh, we're looking at the robot designs here for Lost in Space. Love that show. Yeah. And one of my favorite things about the show, I didn't I didn't know that you'd, you'd worked on, on robot at the time, mm -hmm. but one of my favorite things about the show was this redesign of this, I, I mean, one of the most, I, one of the more iconic robots that oh, you absolutely. see in absolutely. science fiction on the original Lost in Space show. So what was it like for you as a designer? I think our viewers would like to hear too, tackling something that's already iconic mm -hmm. and then reinterpreting it. And, you know, I think you you took it in some really adventurous directions. And, and finally, what we saw on screen, which is the first iteration I saw, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was really pleasing um, because I think it was, in my opinion, as mysterious and as interesting visually as, you know, the original robot would have been back in the, you know, was it 60s when the show yeah, was on? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I mean, this one, I mean, thank you for asking, because like to me, this one is is near and dear to my heart, you know, on multiple levels. Um, when when we when I was at my previous studio, um, you know, it came in, they say, hey, Netflix is going to reboot Lost in Space. And I thought, oh, wow. I mean, I really there's a saw, you know, there's a there's a special place for the 90s one in in, in my heart, too. But um, it was something I kind of bonded with with my dad. You know, when he was growing up, the original series was on television. So, you know, and I, I, I think it was always a great way. I think, you know, we had different interests, but, you know, uh, my dad, he you know, he, he bonds with me on, on, on the loss of space. I remember buying him like the Jupiter two, like a little die cast kind of hot wheel size uh, vehicle. And, and, and of course robot. So this was a shape that was like, just, you know, it's ingrained. And I think sometimes people confuse him with Ro Robbie, the robot, which was, you know, in some, um, you know, uh, films in, in a similar era, but the very iconic, you know, Taurus glass Taurus shape on the head. And he's mm -hmm. a man-made robot. So of course the first, you know, when, when on loss of space, the design directive came in, they said, Oh, there's gonna be the robots in it, but it's not. It's not your. It's not your dad's robot, you know. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's alien life form. It is impossibly human, which be created. You know, I'll get into that some. Uh, you know, uh, further challenges in the design. Um, but what you see here, are just some. You know, early two D iterations to really push it. And you know, it's always tough when you jump onto an existing property, even though this was a reimagining. Or you know, you do have that iconography burned into your head. So anytime you step onto an existing franchise, whether it's you know, a Marvel project like we did with X-Men or the Predator, you know, things that, especially when you really love them and, and you're a diehard fan and you go, well, I, ha as a designer, I have that responsibility to push things forward and mm -hmm. to show something new. Um, so it was kind of freeing in the sense that they said, look, it's impossibly human. At that point, it was just going to be a hundred percent CG asset. So we started punching a bunch of negative space through it. And, you know, so it wouldn't be a guy in a suit. Um, so I did these sketches and then kind of what you showed uh, originally, I would, the idea of those kind of like repeating plates and stuff, those organic plates. And it kind of went away and it, it went um, with some other artists. I believe they even outsourced it. Like, you know, I saw after the fact that a bunch of other artists um, had taken a stab at it. And it was funny actually seeing my piece like reworked on it. So it was great to say, oh, how did that person take and handle it? But then I guess production kind of doubled back around and came back to this idea of these repeating shapes. So what you're looking at here are the some of the earliest sort of 3d iterations of this repeating plating that they said well this isn't the design per se but it's it's sort of the direction we want to go 
So the idea of the design place, the organic forms that followed that human-esque form um, was something that was the guiding, uh, you know, the guiding direction throughout the course of this design. And then ultimately, um, you know, as you mentioned before, Adam, with all the iterations, I was very fortunate that I got to see this through almost the entire design process. And, oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, in tandem with Jared Krzyzewski, who you know, handled some of the chest plates and stuff. It was some here again, you don't work in a vacuum. So him and I then collaborated and, and I took pieces from his and then ultimately got to see it all the way through to the point where um, it actually was handed off to Spectral Motion, the very talented practical effects shop, because um, they actually ended up building the guy in the suit, which was funny yeah. because then how do you take this design that's impossibly human and put a human in it and they they did a beautiful job translating so then we had to kind of retroactively make it work for an actor so then we went back through and and, and i was able to help them kind of bridge the bridge the gap there and then and, and bring it to screen so yeah well and i think you know this I, and I didn't anticipate this but what a great uh, this particular project a great way for you to sort of unpack you know all the different stuff that goes into it's not like you get a brief and you sit down and you do a couple of incredible paintings, you know, and then the director goes, Oh, that one. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Uh, exactly. So, I mean, even uh, we were just seeing three, you know, uh, quick, you know, sort of colorized and, and rendered sketches, but, you know, early on in the process, I think for, for people that might be aspiring towards this type of type of position, um, I mean, what would you guesstimate was like maybe the number of like thumbnails, like some of the stuff that's only for your eyes, Oh. in a really early process. Yeah, so like the thumbnails you see, like, you know, maybe a dozen or like I always tell my students, hey, like a couple dozen depending on time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know how many I sent over to you, Adam, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the, the work I pass along. But yeah, quite I, a few. I was going to say, dude, I think, I, what, 50 or 60 incarnation? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's not a week's worth of work. I was on it for months and stuff, uh, you know, but then just kind of, you know, you pivot with the, the shifts in production or their needs and stuff. But uh, yeah, all in all, I mean, I, mean, I did countless just faceplate designs and some of them played homage to that original Taurus design, you know, that little wink and nod to, you know, the original fans and, and yeah. was adamant that that's not where we're going to go. This is going to be something different. <laughs> so we try, you know, and we're, we're fans too. And I mean, of course, everyone in, you know, in the chat, you know, we're all fans of this stuff. So it's not like we're, you know, shrugging or I don't know what this is. You know, we do our research and we try and put those little Easter eggs yeah. or, you know, uh, love letters to, to the fans, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it that, that, you know, never gets seen, you know, and that's why I think it's cool to follow artists and stuff online because they'll post stuff that the art books won't and you truly get a feel for how much really goes into, you know, producing those races. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep rolling on yeah. some of the slides we've got left, but I think it, you, this provides us a great opportunity before we get into you showing, you know, you got, you're going to break down some artwork for us but before yeah. we get to yeah. that. Um, maybe if you could just talk to us a little bit about, you know, for you and and for your your design ideology, um, what are some of the things that are important to you um, to make a a creature or any kind of concept design you're doing iconic? Iconic, ah, yeah, that's that's the that's the question, Adam. Right, like that's the big word, right? And or, or we want to see something we've never seen before. Never seen before, <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. And then you you know some of the shows or some of the productions actually have the time and, and the means to actually explore things out fully because anyone that you know, hey, we're all fans of these designs, and you go, well, you don't design the xenomorph overnight, right? You know, it takes right. a lot of work, and not to mention that was something already swimming around in Giger's head, you know, before it was actually materialized for the screen. Uh, but, uh, you know, for that, for the sort of the iconography or something being iconic, you know, for me, it, it, it's silhouette. It's that primary form. It, it's exploring something that, you know, will appeal to the audience's sensibilities, trying to not regurgitate things that you've seen out there. And I'll talk a little bit about this more when we do the breakdown, but it's something that I harp on a lot in class too, which is not getting stuck in this trap of just kind of following these, you know, these cyclical patterns of going to art station or, you know, CG society, wherever you find, you know, or Instagram, wherever you're looking at artwork and, and, and subconsciously collecting all that and just putting that back out with your own flavor on top of it. So it is no easy feat. And, and now with so many, you know, with, with anything and everything possible, thanks to CG and it's, you know, it's fusion with practical effects. It's like, we've seen it all and, and it's tough. And there've been a lot of, I mean, there've been designs that I've done self familiar where, you know, after the fact, I find something very similar because people came to natural conclusions or maybe I, you know, it, it's, it's out there. Someone was tackling anatomy in a similar way and they go, this is not easy to do when you're tasked with, with coming up with something original and new. So, you know, the more you can do to, 
gather reference or explore, you know, widen your horizons and stuff. And ultimately you can open yourself up to some, you know, more creative designs, but yeah, I do. I mean, iconic, it, it, it's tough. And, and that's ultimately the goal. You know, when you're trying to go through something, it's like, what, what will stand out? And to me, in my mind, I'm always trying to keep, you know, because I, I focus so much on primary forms and it's really mm -hmm. a large part, thanks to the, those who inspired me, like Ralph McQuarrie and, you know, Doug Chang and Ian McKay, these guys were, it, it's the shape. It's how you look at, on it, you know, how it looks on film. And for me, it's like, you know, could a four-year-old grab crayons and, and try and draw this shape and stuff, you know? And I feel that has a large part uh, or has a large, um, you know, a factor of how it resonates and how it kind of stays in pop culture. Can you, can you replicate it? You yeah. Know? That's, that's a really good point. Actually. I, I never quite thought of it that way. Um, and I think that's why, I mean, at least, at least for me, and I think a lot of folks from, from our generation, I know that there's a lot of new things today that are kind of that for, you know, for some of the, some of the younger artists coming up. But I remember, you know, Ralph McQuarrie's designs for Star Wars, like TIE fighters, like a circle and a couple of, you know, vertical lines. I remember feeling as a kid, like I can draw that. Yeah. You know? And Absolutely. you can do an entire scene with these yeah. really simple shapes, but yeah. I think that's part of the appeal. And I'm going to take a quick aside and give a shout out here because um, I know that you worked on the character Daito for um, Ready Player One, which I love that film. Really cool film. And uh, I know that Daito, you know, for me and for a lot of other people is one of our favorite characters oh. um, in the movie. So, um, you know, how did you... How do you jump into? I mean, had you read the book before you before you got the gig, or did you need to familiarize yourself with the story? Or I, I did. You know, it's funny. Ernest Klein was always on my radar and stuff because he was a Star Wars fan and stuff. So I'd heard him. I remember hearing him on a Star Wars podcast years before, and he goes, "Hey, I'm working on this book called Ready Player One, and this is the gist." So it almost always felt like it was on the periphery of of my life. Like it would always dip in and out. And this was one of the first projects. I mean, this was pretty early on in my time at the previous studio where. Um, it came in and 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 for those of you that know anything about the book i mean you just know what how what a vast you know expansive story it is so we did start with um uh you know the primary or the kind of the high five you know the the, the main protagonist of the story um you know so was, there were some earlier um versions you saw in there for uh parcival and stuff but you know we were working in tandem with ilm on this and and once again steve sue and i were kind of tackling uh uh, you know, show or Shoto and Dido at the same time. And I did some show he did, you know, so inevitably, or, or, you know, it ended up, he took show and I took Dido and really got to see it through most of this design process. So this was kind of a pinch me thing. Not only am I working on a Spielberg project, which is a bucket list item to check off and, you know, and you get that feedback, like, Oh, well, Stephen said this about, and I was like, you know, you're like, <laughs> you can you pinch me? And I was like, well, yeah. I'm good now. I guess I can retire. I'm done. <laughs> because I was like, where do I, you know, it's like the guy that peaks in high school. You know, I said, this is one of the, my first projects out of the gate. And I thought, you know, and then you just got to keep your head level and go, no, this is, I still have a lot to learn, a lot of things to focus on. Um, you know, because even looking back on these, like, it's what I could do at that point. You know, I look at them now and go, okay, this is how I would kind of tackle it then. But, you know, here again, you're dealing with the samurai armor. It's a robot. There's a lot of versions of that out there. You see samurai robots and stuff. So it's like, well, how do I do this in an iconic way? And, you know, playing up this helmet. And it was cool because, like, some of these story elements I actually got to introduce and they made them into the film, like all the oh, cool. lights or, like, the heated up blade, which is, like, you know, you're not doing a lightsaber, but can I do a katana that has, like, a similar vibe to it? And here again, it's, it's about these visuals because you're going to have this scene where, you have hundreds, if not thousands, of characters vying for your 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 attention, right? And your high five have to stand out. And I think that's why you know Mr. Spielberg is a genius because it's like you know he draws your attention, you immediately recognize you know the five of them on, on screen together. So, well, thanks, thanks, Adam. Yeah, no, I mean he was definitely a baby. I got the the pop toy up there and stuff. I mean that was kind oh, yeah. of surreal. It was the first thing I got to hold based on that. And then, of course, yeah, you got spawn so we got to take a stab at obviously f like licensed characters because ready player one i mean it was like a dream project because not only did oh, we, yeah. we were tasked with coming up with our own guys like you see one on the right was kind of you know um a little bit more out of my comfort zone that kind of more like blizzard aesthetic because you mm -hmm. know the directive came down from ilm they said hey we've got a lot of gunters or these background characters um that are very human-esque they're bipedal and stuff because that's what we kind of gravitate towards so we really need to push it and at this point, they were like, and I and Spawn is in the final one. I remember Jared Kuchesky and I both like taking stabs at designing this. In fact, I think that's his cape on top of mine. So here again, very collaborative, uh, yeah, collaborative effort. But you know, all these characters, you know, at one point they're like, 
you know, there might be DC characters and, and, and Marvel characters facing off and all these horror villains and stuff. And you're like, Oh my God. It's like, it's like the ultimate toy box that you get to play around. Totally. With. Yeah. Now, is this another Gunter that you did for the film as well? I did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this was, this was after that directive came in to say, Hey, we just need weird stuff. We need things. Right. That aren't, uh, aren't those bipedal human forms. So playing with this kind of, uh, um, centaur ape, simian centaur, mm -hmm. you know, now the, the next one, I I just I fell in love with this guy when I when I saw him in the work. He's actually one of my favorites because this guy makes me feel like this is the Gunter that like is the ultimate fanboy. Like he he's having the time of his life right now. <laughs> just absolutely, has to this be is a great. This is my Gunter. Yeah, <laughs> a dinosaur with plasma cannons and a and a laser yeah. sword. You know, absolutely, dude, absolutely. And in fact, like. I mean, here, there's a bunch of Easter eggs. And, and, and the funny thing about this, every design had to go through Warner Brothers legal department because obviously, right, like we were dealing with. And this was a in, in, in two at that point. They said, look, you know, they say, Stephen, I'll say Mr. Spielberg, um, you know, uh, he, basically he didn't want anything from his own films in there, which I could totally understand where it would feel very self-referential or self, uh, you know, con uh, congratulatory and stuff. Um but us as fans and, and us loving his work, we said, well, let us do it. Let's do it for you, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously I mentioned I'm a Jurassic Park fan. So this is not only based on Jurassic Park, but the toy, the Kenner toys of the 90s yeah. that were so, so like even the neck pieces right off the toys. Obviously you got Tim's night vision goggles and the, the Ford Explorer. And then I think the 18 is from one of the Explorers, but uh, one of the designers was like, well, what if he just has like an electro blade like Samurai Sword? And I was like, why not? Let's just throw everything at the wall. Yeah. And, and see what uh, see what hits, but Rexy does make it in in the film. You know she's she's in there during the race sequence, but not not quite like this. But thank you, Adam. Yeah, this one this was like, hey, this is my love letter. Like I'm I'm throwing totally. it totally. We'll see what. Well, I, I remember uh, hearing Steven Spielberg speak about that in the special features. You know. Yeah. On the film, it was because he was, you know, he, he didn't want to make it about him. But then all the artists were like, "Are you kidding me? Like, yeah, how, you are Back me. to the Future, <laughs> Jurassic Park. I mean, I come on, yeah. yeah. Like, how do we so, not include you? Yeah. So yeah, thanks, thanks to you and the other artists. You know, we were able to see some of the, the a lot of the imagery that we wanted to see in the yeah, film. Yeah, we tried. <laughs> we tried. Yeah, it. we tried. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we just got some more iterations. Yeah. Uh, we're coming. We're we're coming to the point where we're getting ready to transition. Yeah, sure. I've got some of your horror stuff that you've done up here too, which is oh, really yeah. cool. time for Halloween. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, guys, I'll I'll give a little bit more info about it later. But Kyle's going to be coming back real soon on the 29th. We're doing a special Halloween edition uh, stream where uh, Kyle. Uh, some of the artists will be having with the four artists, but you know Kyle as well as a. Uh, you know, uh, Jared Krzyzewski, who's Kyle, Kyle's work with uh, Jared Morantz we had on last week. We've got we've got some amazing creature artists that are come on and they're actually going to draw together um, and design some really cool creatures. So if you're looking for like a really cool hang with some amazing artists, um, I'll give you the more more details on who and when later. But I want to give a shout out now just in case, you know, I don't know, you got something burning on the stovetop and you miss it later. Um, oh, yeah, the Predator. This is awesome. How cool is it to get to work on the Predator? Oh, that was that was phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, Cause this yeah. was like right back, you know, here again, it's like, I knew, you know, we, we keep our ear to the ground and go, Hey, Shane Black's doing a new Predator. And then of course we have that Monday meeting. They're like, Hey, Predator's coming in. I was like, Oh, that's it. You know, that or an alien project. So, um, and I was on it twice, ironically, you know, we were on very early pre-production, then it went away and then it came back during post where they were doing mm -hmm. some pickups and that's where that kind of Predator killer suit comes from and stuff. So very quick. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm, we're going to get ready uh, just a couple minutes, guys. And Kyle's actually going to break down some of his process for us. And he's some of that breakdown is going to be, you know, uh, you know, referencing some of the stuff that he, you know, walks his students through um, in his classes. Um, these are I, both of these pieces, I believe, actually are a couple of pieces yep. you do as a part of your creature design class. Yep. You, you design right along um, with your students, which is really cool. Um, but I just didn't want to miss any of the amazing slides we've got here. Yeah, this stuff is great. And I think um, one of the things I love about your work, Kyle, is I, I really, even in, in the 3D work, I feel the the, the 2D design sensibility. Um, and then in the 2D work, I can see, you know, the intent towards 3D. Um, and I know that that's something that's learned. Um, and I love the way you bring it together. Some of the X-Men stuff that you've done. Yeah, these are really cool. Thank you, dude. Yeah, yeah that's, I always do. I try and, you know, and, and I know for a lot of the artists too, you know, at the uh, previous studio, 
um, we, we, we really wanted to hold on to that, that illustrative quality to it. Cause that's what inspired us. So even if we move into 3d, um, trying to find that balance with the, the, the 2d design aspect of it. So. This is one of your personal pieces, right? It is. Yeah. I yeah. just kind of threw it in. The, yeah. Just kind of with a little hard surface and that's that, that awesome. Huge shout out. And, and this was something I was doing kind of on the precipice of, of trying um, or, or finding my way into the current studio. I'm at cloud Imperium games. So we're doing a lot of cool sci-fi gear for those of you that are familiar with the, the studio. Very cool. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to get, we're going to take a moment to get Kyle's screen um, up on the stream um, because I, we're going to jump just a little bit into um, we've kind of we we've and I we did this order intentionally, but we've got to kind of see the the end result mm -hmm. of, of a lot of these efforts. And you know, there's a lot of kind of stuff that that we'll see from artists out there. Um, and I and I think for for some of our younger artists or artists that are just aspiring towards this and getting started, um, it can be easy to feel like, well, but I you know, how do I just draw that out of the gate? How do I just make that? Um, and you know, the challenge. Whereas you know, in the past there were fewer resources available. I think there's there's the blessing and the challenge of having so many resources today that sometimes we can see stuff that's that we feel like I have to kind of aim at that at the beginning. But um, the reason why I wanted Kyle to unpack a little bit of his process for us is because one of the really important things um, that we believe here at Noman as well is if you learn the right building blocks in the right sequence, if you learn the foundational stuff and then you build the necessary things on top of that, this is something that's learnable. This is something that can be taught. Um, and uh, I don't think any artist out there working in the industry today would tell you, well, it's just about talent because talent makes it easy and I can just make it, you know. Yep. So um, we're going to we're going to take a little bit of a dive into uh, Photoshop, Kyle, and take a look at some of the stuff that he's done. Awesome. Thanks. I'm no and I and I completely echo everything you just said. I mean, it is um, uh, talent is one of the great myths and stuff. You know, some people might come at it at a, from a different point or experience or had access to certain technologies or things, you know, at a certain point. But, uh, you know, I, I have seen students come in with, uh, very little experience with some of the techniques and pipelines we talk about in class and just run away with it, you know, and just find themselves in there really, really focus and, and really develop, um, those uh, disciplines and, and come up with some really beautiful work. So yeah, thanks, Adam. I, um, so guys, I'm just going to run through um, just kind of step by step. Um, though this is not like a a tutorial um, per se, I will uh, give a self plug. <laughs> um, I was invited to do a Nomen workshop tutorial um, at the beginning of this quarantine. So I know this site's been redesigned a little bit and it looks gorgeous. Um, so in the coming soon section, you'll find that there's sort of a, a, a workshop on the way called um, uh, Intro to Creature Design and it's volume one because I actually did so much work that we're gonna break it into two volumes and, and cover these two different things. Mm -hmm. um, it is designed to be a supplement to my um, to my in-person or in-person uh, class at Nomen. So for those of you that have maybe taken my class or interested, um, we're going to focus on certain elements inside of the class. And then the workshop will be based on some different principles. In fact, Adam, um, I pass along one, if you guys remember through there, if you go back through the stream, um, there was some sort of non-photo blue sort of studies and stuff. Those are actually from the workshop. So oh, those nice. Are, okay. nice little tease of what's yeah. coming up there. So um, well, and I, if you don't mind me interrupting yep. real quick, I'm so glad you mentioned that too. Um, and I, I did want to clarify, guys, so what we're going to see right here is um, we're just going to talk about process that this isn't meant to be a, a tutorial or, or a lesson in that sense. Really, it's meant to break to break it down and to kind of, you know, pull back the curtain a little bit and say like, you know, these, these are some of the steps that are involved and these are learnable steps. But yeah, absolutely. If you, if you're interested in what you're seeing here, um, you know, definitely look into taking uh, Kyle's class, even if you just want to take it as an individual class at Noman. Um, would you say that the Noman workshop uh, being supplemental to your, to your class, uh, is that something that someone who hasn't taken your class yet also could take a look at? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, absolutely dude. Um, cause it was designed where if you, um, you, you didn't know who I was, you just stumbled upon it or whatever, that this was from a step one. Um, yeah. it is just covering maybe a few different technical like techniques in terms of like the actual rendering process that are a little different than what I show in person, but that's just to give a wide variety because my hope is that once it is available, I can tell my students who are currently enrolled, Hey, 
here's more if you're interested or you kind of want to go back over a few steps or if you don't have the ability or you're thinking about maybe in the future taking the creature design you can start with the you know the, the workshop video and and, and see if that kind of piques your interest so awesome. yeah thanks Adam. thanks for the yeah clarification there um yeah so absolutely guys and 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 um as adam mentioned before and in tease actually one of the images he showed is what i'm going to kind of break down uh today with you all uh this is you know, it's probably a process that, you know, a lot of you are familiar with. If you're not, that's the goal of the class. Um, I treat it like a step one. Everyone's coming in at different levels, varying levels, but we're all going to talk about the same foundational skills. So I really pride myself on tracking each student's progress throughout the, uh, excuse me, throughout the term. So regardless of your experience or knowledge of creature design or figure drawing or zoological illustration, uh, you can come at it from, from that point and then build upon that. So I've had students that have never picked up a stylus or a Wacom pen in their life and kind of figure out those skills as they work through it while in tandem thinking about the zoological aspects or the anatomical or the 2D de design principles that go into it. So, um, you know, one of the first things we talk about in class is, is gathering reference and thinking about things in a clear and concise way and understanding why we gather the reference we do. So uh, the aspect ratio is a little bit different than I ask for in class, but just to keep things a bit more harmonious as we go through these step by step, um, uh, keep it a little bit cleaner. But I actually make a distinction between two different things. What With one, I call the reference board and, and a second what I call a mood board. Um, so you'll notice that on the reference board here is 100% uh, real for the most part, except there is a, a sculpture up here. This is, I would, I would, uh, oh, this is the only thing that I would contest is actually a, a piece of art, but it is something that occupies a real space. It is a, it is a sculpture out in nature. But for the most part here, every piece is, is, a photo, it is real imagery. You know, of course you have the benefit of looking at something in person, all that much better. You know, so when the world opens back up, if you can find yourself at the LA Zoo, of course, taking your own reference or doing your own sketches, that's the best. Um, but this is this is what I have students start off with first. And what this does is it keeps them in their own arena and, and looking at, you know, the best designer on the planet, which is nature, right? So, you know, we're gonna look at, you know, different varying levels of, of of say, you know, a form of texture of color of light on our surfaces and, and obviously anatomical structures to help figure out the physiology of our creatures and build from there. Uh, later you, on, yep. Sorry, could you just uh, yeah. very, very quickly just zoom in and get yes. around your board real quick, just just for folks who, who might not Absolutely. see it big on the screen. Yeah, you can see it's everything, you know, things that feel a little bit more designy, you know, it looks almost like a cat skull here. And this is a fish, yeah. you know abstract shapes that might not necessarily translate one-to-one -one with the creature I'm, I'm doing. Cause you can see there's, I mean, we we're, we're all over the place here. We got Wolverines, chimpanzees, we've got, you know, hunched over, you know, an elderly skeleton piranha. We have, you know, tardigrades, but what this is, is I'm looking at form. I'm looking at light or, or I'm looking at texture and, and skin here and all kind of, this will all kind of make sense or hopefully will make sense here in a second when we kind of talk in, uh, about the design directive of, of, you know, what this piece was, you know, design for, um, you know, of course, anatomy. And, and this is a big thing that I harp on too, is not just finding one shot, but finding bodies in motion and in different body structures or different, different body types. You know, we all have the same, you know, for the most part, you know, except for a few uh, variations here and there, you know, the musculature is the same across every person. So it's just saying, well, how is it allocated on this person or how is it accentuated or, you know, on different athletes, you know, what muscle group is in focus. So it, it gives you a lot to work with. Um, and that's another thing to bring up too. Um, I do not push you guys to become anatomy experts. We talk about anatomy in the sense of, of form, you know, light and shadow. So just coming up with shapes, and we'll double back here to that in a second, that idea um, here in a moment, where, you know, this stuff will come with with time and, and just, you know, with reference and just looking at it over and over again, where you can actually start to break down muscle groups and, and block things out that way. But we're going to look at things just from an observational standpoint and just say, okay, what are these forms and how can I do that? How can I do it myself to create my own creatures? Mm -hmm. 
Then we'll jump over to, so this is what we consider a mood board. So this might be other artists' work, sculptural elements, frames from films, shots from comic books you like, anything and everything. The goal here is to kind of capture the essence of your design without duplicating what you're seeing here. So this can be kind of a fine line that we kind of have to tread because this is unfortunately where I, you know, in my opinion, a lot of artists fall into where you go on art station, you see something really cool and you feel like you have to implement that in your work. So what I'm doing here and what you guys will see as I progress through is this is based on one of the prompts um, that I do for the final. The final is a real world scenario where you, the artist, is given a brief from a client. So at this point, it'd be production, whether it's the producer, the art director, you know, costume designer. In our case, we're dealing creature. So it's it's coming from production. It's Maybe it's a brief that is a, you know, it's from production or it's based off of the description of the creature in the script, right? So there are elements we have to adhere to. There are sort of gaps in there where we can put our own flavor on it. And we have to do a couple of design iterations based on that concept. So nothing we do can negate what's in the prompt. Um, it can only supplement or add to. Um, so we, we, we first start with the reference board and earlier on in our first assignment in the term. And then in the back half of the term, when we jump into our final, that's when, um, you know, students are more comfortable with the process. We start talking about this idea of mood, getting a little bit more comfortable with observing other artists' work and finding elements that we can bring into our own work without duplicating it here. So you can see um, I'm kind of dealing with this amorphous, you know, transformative creature design that's not quite the thing but it's a similar vein where it's this sort of mimicking creature that's trying to emulate uh, more of an organic form. So you can see it's trying its best, but not quite getting there. So that's our mood board. So next it kind of jumps to, let, let, and um, before we go too far here, just want to talk about the foundational things that, that are the very keystone of the way I structure my class. And it starts with these guys. So primitive shapes, that's it. So the, uh, the, the theory behind my class and, and the way I teach it is it is um, we, we talk about the objective, the things that are tried and true. And that comes down to the 2D design principles that everything is based off of. Um, everyone comes into class with phenomenal ideas. I do not teach creature ideas. Everyone has their own. And a lot of that will be, of course, dictated by production when you're on a, a project. So it's about how you infuse your personal touch on it, but you have to execute on someone else's designs. So I want to give you sort of the toolbox um, to, to kind of give you that foundation so that regardless of what the idea is, you can, you can execute on it. You can design whatever you want. And that holds true whether it's, you know, it's a photo real gnarly creature that you see coming out of the Conjuring universe, or if you're designing a dragon for how to train your dragon, these principles hold true. So we start with, you know, our 2D principles. We're looking at, it's only graphic shapes here. In fact, you see a, a kind of an uneven triangle here, right? I just, I just uh, uh, hand drew that, did not do the circle. No way I'd be that good at it. Um, <laughs> And then of course we start to move into the more the volumetric. So taking a square and turning it into a cube, right? A, yeah. a sphere pyramid and obviously a circle into a sphere. Now, of course, um, we talk about the idea that form, um, you know, or light or form change is indicated by value change. So that's a big thing we uh, that I, I refocus on class. And that's also, you know, regardless of whether you're taking other classes at Noman or have other experiences, um, to me, this is a continuation of what we would discuss like in a VizCom class. So the idea here is to not compartmentalize things that you're learning in other class, uh, other classes. So we're, we're talking about figure drawing. We're talking about perspective drawing. We're talking about color theory. All that stuff gets kind of factored in to this soup or these ingredients that equal creature design. And if I may interject really quick yeah, here, because um, one of the things that's so cool about this, bringing it down to just those elemental shapes and then understanding their volume and how to render them like this is this is doing this stuff right here this is art one at high school yep. you know like if you're an art student in high school and i don't know maybe i know that i did when i was when i was young you kind of yep. roll your eyes at like okay the teacher wants me to make a ball great yep. you know, i want to make something cool <laughs> but um what's amazing is like the you know, if you pay attention when you're in high school you're picking up these kind of skills that kyle's saying like this is what's necessary to get your to get your design started, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I know that absolutely, dude. This is it. It is. It's the kind of stuff you're like, all right, how many cubes do I have to draw? But then you realize, oh, there is. I can take these cubes and then move it into something like this. I can start to translate them into more organic or complex forms. So here you see, I mean, that's basically a cylinder. But we talk about this more in greater depth in the class, where we essentially start with a stick figure and then start to block out our creatures 
with these basic, these forms, you know, looking whether it's something more planar, like we're looking at here, which is kind of this, you know, basically looks like a giant HVAC vent or something, but it's a, it's a cube that we're just kind of bending in, in perspective or, or here, it's just a elongated, you know, um, a spherical shape overlap one another where we can quickly start to make muscle groups this way. So I think there's a tendency to see the final creature and go, well, how do I even get to that stage? And the, and the reality is it's just a bunch of simple shapes that add up to more complex forms. That's all it is, regardless of whether you're doing a creature, a character, costume, prop, environment, you name it. The, the, these are all the same principles that feed into that. So that's why I really want to focus on this, because once you have these, your idea can be whatever you want it to be. You can just build on top. So this is where we really focus. In fact, the first assignment of the class uh, uh, is to actually observe a real animal or a few different animals and break them down to these sort of rudimentary shapes. If you guys have ever seen, like if you go to Blick or any of the art supply stores, or you've seen those wooden mannequins that are basically just cylindrical shapes, that's kind of the theory we're following. So they do have a purpose there. Um, you know, they can have a different purpose depending on what you're doing, but we're essentially saying, well, how do I come up with my own mannequin for my own creature that has six legs and never been seen before? So then of course, uh, from there, you know, we jump into uh, the thumbnailing phase. So this this very freeing uh, portion of the process where we're just exploring the silhouette. Um, you can see here, there are, there are some, you know, shapes cut in and out. Um, Really, the goal here is not to distinguish any sort of form. We're not handling light and shadow. It is purely about silhouette. It's what I mentioned before. Um, you know, it, it's really about thinking about that, as Adam mentioned, that iconic shape or something that's a bit different. And here, you know, we're, we're dealing with this kind of amorphous, you know, creature from the horror genre. So I want it to feel contorted or a bit in pain. It's this thing that is not naturally occurring. And so a few different shapes here. So, um, so then we, we move the setup. So we'll, we'll work through thumbnailing stage. You know, that will be one assignment in its own right after we've done research. And I will have students do pages of these. And, and the point is to get you guys out of your comfort zone, to get you out of what we call the muscle memory area or to kind of brush off the cobwebs, which when, you know, if asked to draw a person, will do one stick figure, essentially they'd all look the same. But when we get to 20, 30, 40, 50 thumbnails down the down the road, that's when we really start to push it and kind of warm up those muscles. So no different than doing any other sort of exercise there. We're just kind of getting in the groove and kind of warming up those like artistic muscles to come up with something different. Then we jump into setup here, which is just kind of, ex, you know, um, blowing up the, the, the essentially the initial uh, silhouette as the extremely rough framework to start to build on top of. So this is our very, very, very loose blueprint that we can start to, uh, you know, work some forms on top of one another. So I'm going to quickly go over this because it's a bit tough to see here, but this is just basically a rough non-photo blue outline, very similar to what I mentioned, just kind of setting up that initial construction. Well, and I think uh, I'll jump in here really quick and say, yeah. you know, kind of speaking for the for the ones that are like looking at this going, well, wait a minute, we just went from basic shapes to like a really awesome blue line drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Kyle, but I'd say, guys, that's why it's important to just draw every day. Yep. Just get used to, uh, really get used to making bad drawings so that you can make good ones. And I think we, we all feel like we have to make the perfect drawing out the gate, but the way that you get to the point that you can interpret your shapes like Kyle's done here is just spending time drawing. Um, Absolutely, guys. Absolutely. And let's let's actually jump in. Even though this isn't a tutorial, what I would say is, and, and Adam's correct here, there is sort of a step here. And I kind of, as I was kind of going through it, where absolutely we would have this rough shape. And, and we'll talk about this more in great depth. And this is something wonderful I got from Jared Morantz when I had him as a creature design, uh, and design instructor, which is just this idea of just indicating the ground plane. And it's amazing how far this goes, this little X here. And for those of you in 3D, imagine this is kind of your X and Z axes right so we're thinking about this big giant you know ground plane in perspective with our horizon line being out there and and two i don't want you guys to panic and go oh my god what are all these lines he's drawing and stuff and the, oh, i hate you know i hate perspective and 2d worry not this is just a kind of rough framework to get things placed so that our creature feels like it's actually uh, excuse me actually occupying a three-dimensional world when we do that and when a foot feels or like a, a pad of a foot or a hoof or something feels like it's actually contacting contacting a ground plane and we feel like our creature is actually occupying a volume, 
then we start to believe in our creature there. So then we can get away with kind of pushing some of the aesthetics that might feel weird or strange or alien to us. But as long as it feels like it's actually occupying a real world, we start to believe it more as an audience. So what I'm saying too, like, you know, and when we start to block these things out and I'm going to be extremely uh, loose with this. In fact, I'm going to use a brush here with zero opacity, treat it like a fine liner uh, pen and see if it lets me do this. But just by finding silver lines in these form lines here that just indicate directionality, I can start to block these things out with, I you mean, know, you guys got it, uh, very simple primitives, right? And by connecting with these forms with, you know, more complex shapes, but with like cylinders and stuff, we can start to make more complex shapes, Ming. So I, I always like to call this for those of you that are collectors or, I mean, everyone's seen a, a doll or an action figure um, or like I mentioned, those drawing man uh, mannequins. That's all we're doing here is essentially we're just figuring out the articulation so I'm just finding areas where I can, you know, find, okay, basically, you know, uh, tracking that silhouette. And you'll notice every once in a while, I'll just do these little form lines. And what these do is help sell the idea of this shape in perspective. So by seeing the bottom of the cylinder, it tells me that that shape is receding back in perspective. So I, I'm just going to use these shapes over and over again to create more complex forms. And then here, it just tells me exactly what shape they're going. So you'll notice, and this is very similar, anyone that's interested in art, we've all picked up those how to draw books, right? Where it's a couple of circles and all of a sudden you got a horse at the end. Well, that's <laughs> great if you're, if you're observing something from life, but it goes, how is that artist jumping the gap? Because what that does is that teaches you how to draw not only a horse, but that horse, that specific design. There's no flexibility outside of that. And they're great in the sense that it gets you drawing, and the best thing to do is to replicate. You know, when we're younger, you copy images, you trace over and stuff. That's the best thing you start to. And then you chisel away and you start to recognize more and more. And, and it's actually funny because, you know, I mentioned Doug Chang's work before. His, his marker work, I love. And he has all these little lines throughout his work. And I know when I replicated, I would put lines everywhere. Because I was like, oh, he's just, it, it's this graphic thing. Well, they're not. They're not, they actually serve a purpose. And I'm, all, I'm, I'm laughing because I've done exactly the same thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> I remember doing that, yeah. I'm thinking like through ellipses. I was like, oh, he's mapping out termination lines and perspective lines just gesturally so he knows the angle of that ellipse to draw or the degree that he's drawn. So that's what they are. They're graphic stand-ins for the perspective, but it works because he's a, you know, he's a, a sort of like a, a production, or excuse me, like a product designer. He came from uh, industrial design. Uh, background. So that was his carryover. And he would even do it with organic shapes. But it was really through Jared's class where, you know, through this ground plane and then finding, okay, if the foot, which is, I mean, let's face it, these, we could bl block this out with stick figure, even with this crazy sort of, you know, arachnid type shape or this multi-limbed creature, well, where am I going to put all this stuff? So by following that ground plane down here in perspective, I know exactly where that other foot would have to terminate in order for it to feel like it's solid on that ground. And then same thing, following that line back in perspective, well, boom, we know exactly where, well, if I can actually do it, if I shift click, this limb could be whatever it wants to be. And all of a sudden now I start to map out exactly where these limbs are gonna fall. And once you have this blocked out, I mean, stick figure, all of a sudden we start to get this feeling that this is actually occupying a real three-dimensional space. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Adam, because you're absolutely right. We were kind of missing a step in between there. So it's kind of, our, it's figuring out our creature just using these basic volumes to find our creature before we jump into all that rendering and the form yeah. and all that extra stuff that comes on top. Well, and thank you so much for, for doing that and starting where you're starting here, Kyle, because, um, you know, I, by the nature of being a representative for Gnome, and I get to talk to a lot of community college students, a lot of high school students, you know, and I think, you know, when they look at like the student reel at Nomen or they see a lot of this finished work, that's the result of maybe many classes or, yes. you know, at least 10 weeks of work. Um, you know, the misconception can be like, well, I don't even have what it takes to, to set foot in the door. Um, it's not really the case. No. Um, and you're not going to be jumping, you know, especially if you're taking the full time program sequentially, you're not going to be jumping in at some level that you're the only person in the class who can't do it. Um, we, the way we structure things, we got it covered. And that's, you know, what Kyle's showing us here is he's going to make sure that all of his students have what they need, uh, yes. to approach this. And I know, you know, my own personal testimonials, like I remember taking creature design with you, having focused a lot on the human form 
and internalizing human form thinking i've never studied an anim animal anatomy i've never this is brand new for me and the way that you unpack this for us really helped me to go oh okay i feel like i'm getting what i need to start to build it and then the rest of it's just repetition after that um, yes get better yeah well thanks Adam. yeah your check's in the mail dude for the <laughs> 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 for all his kind words, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and that's and that's um, really the benefit of taking the class. And the beautiful thing about being online is, in fact, I've had students inquire, they're like, hey, I'm in Europe right now and it, like trying to figure out the schedule or, hey, am I willing to jump up at 3 a.m. to jump into a class and stuff? And I say, I'm here if you want to take it. You know, that is the beauty of being online right now. Um, so we haven't skipped a beat. It's all the same stuff. But even with that, the critique process is the most important thing. And that is what I feel is the distinction between, you know, obviously like the workshop videos, which are great because they're supplemental or they add to, you know, existing things, or it's an alternative way of thinking of something, but being in person or doing these classes online where we get to communicate one-on-one -on -one is the critique process where I can actually work, walk through you guys, uh, work through each one of your own um, designs in your work and make sure that these things are working. So like I said, regardless of your background or your knowledge of the things we're talking about, we'll work together to make sure that everyone kind of brings it up level by level together. For sure. Yeah. So then ultimately, yeah, absolutely. So the design here, so we block it out. I think I'm just missing. I think we had this backup silhouette here. So I'll jump ahead. Um, you know, obviously things like, you know, a little cast shadow to help just reinforce that ground plane. But, um, yeah, so here then inevitably, and we'll go through these in, in greater depth um, in class, but uh, it might seem like a little bit of a jump here. But once we have the line in there, we, we, we jump into value. And you can see actually some of this is still pretty light. Um, and, and of course, I don't dictate style in here. Um, I give you the tools to work out your style. Um, now, style will never be a, an excuse for incorrect design principles. So I'm, I'm I still... I, I will challenge you guys on the perspective, the anatomy, the form, the light, the shadow, all that stuff has to be there. But then what you decide to do with those shapes and, and sort of uh, uh, the aesthetic of your piece is totally up to you. Now, that being said, the goal of the class is still to produce what we call a photo real creature at the end. So something that feels materialistically like correct, right? It feels like it's lit by proper lighting. The textural read is correct. All the materials seem right. Color sounds, you know, seems good. All that is in place. Um, so we work on, you know, this is just initial form. And then we kind of work through the process of adding uh, textures. There isn't much on this one because there's some that I add later. Uh, looking at some gnarly stuff. I think this was from like a scar makeup or hamburger meat and stuff. And, you know, elephant uh, pachyderm skin, wrinkles and scars. So we talk about implementing photo textures into our work. And there's actually a couple of different ways to implement that. So we do spend time working on the technical side. So jumping into Photoshop and going over how these things work. Um, that being said too, if you're brand new to Photoshop, I go over every command and everything that I use. I treat it like it's your first time in Photoshop. So regardless of your skills, um, you might know it and say, cool, I've got it, Kyle. Or else you could say, ooh, maybe, you know, I knew something similar to that, but I can do it in a different way. And I've already had students show me a similar thing and say, oh, well, this is how I do it. And then I've implemented that. I go, oh, that's even that much more efficient. So I jump over and start to use that. Um, and of course we start to introduce color. So you can see here, um, you know, we're working our values. We're working almost the you know, very similar way. We will work in traditional painting, doing, you know, a, an underpainting, handling the values and then washing color. Um, the goal of the class is to really work on what we call a non-destructive workflow, uh, which is a key element to working in design in a collaborative environment, like most of us designers do, where our pieces um, inevitably are, are not just our own, right? They might be handed to another artist within our, you know, little production pod, or they might get handed to another studio. So the, the whole goal here is that, you know, you want your files workable in the way where you can easily go back layer by layer and, and make adjustments as need be. So that if a client comes back and says, you know, Kyle, it's great, but, um, you know, it needs to be green, not red. Yeah, there's a huge that you know hue slider, but maybe you know that changes everything at once. Maybe I just want control of the red individually. So we'll go over all that and figure out a way to work smarter, not harder, kind of stuff. So um, and uh, we, you know there's some pretty cool workflows, and I'm always excited that week uh, when I get to show you guys a couple of particular things uh, because uh, for me I find that people go, oh that that can really help out things. So uh, we're not tooting our own horn. It was just something that we felt we could implement. And, and give to everyone. There's no secret sauce. It's just a way of working that'll make things a bit more streamlined for you going forward. 
Well, and you're making a great point there too, in, in that you know the difference between artistic skill and uh, using a uh, software tool. Yes. I think a lot of times people think, well, you know, Photoshop will make me better artist because you can do all these neat things. But at the end of the day, I mean, the process you're showing us here, it's, the fundamentals of the process could be used with you're doing it with paint or colored pencil or, or whatever it is. But it's that it's a Photoshop here is not what makes the art great. It just allows those tools to do those extra things you're talking about where do you have the digital layers that you can go back and change and adjust for more Absolutely. flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, you're you're hundred percent correct. And that was one thing that was a big takeaway I had from Jared Morantz's class. And he would say, you know, if I'm if I get tripped up on something, like I might just, you know, I might do a napkin sketch first. And you know, maybe because that sensation of a pen on paper feels different than a stylus on screen or on Cintiq or tablet. Um, and, and they do generate different results. You know, I, I draw differently on my iPad versus a pen and paper versus the Cintiq. So it, it uh, they do vary. There are little variations in it. Um, you know, for me uh, personally, but, uh, you know, I think for a majority, I probably still feel the same way. But, um, you know, I've told students, there's a good portion of this that can be done traditionally, or if you have that traditional painting background, you'll find that there are a lot of parallels. So, in fact, a lot of my workflow here, even down to the brush I use, is is all designed to really emulate that traditional workflow, because I, I didn't necessarily want that digital feel to, to the work. So it's got a little, little tooth to it. But yeah, thank you. I mean, that's, yeah, it's absolutely a great point. Um, and then, uh, you know, from there we start to, uh, um, you know, clean elements up here. So you can see, I, I'm starting to introduce, um, some additional photo textures and I'll just go, um, sort of, uh, let's see here, you know, it is definitely a progressive workflow. So you'll see, this is basically a duplicate of, you know, what I had before, um, working up, you know, boosting some of that shadow, that form, trying to pull it out of the light, just give it a little bit extra volume, like the idea that there's this sort of key light hitting. We don't do anything too dramatic um, to start off with, nothing too crazy, because of course with the Bing design, it's all about communicating this character fully. So it's three quarter to camera, it's showing us off as much as possible with this one view to your client, what this creature is actually gonna look like. Um, throwing in a little bit of rim light that I think it worked, you know, just for a little extra drama, but it does a, a good job of sort of accenting the rest of that silhouette there. Um, here you can see, and I'll zoom in here so you guys can see, um, I, I, I really emphasize material here. So this is where like observing your texture and what you can glean from that. Cause um, you know, if you guys remember on my reference board, I had like a, I think it was like a tiny foxy or something with that kind of subsurfacey translucency. So I'm trying to capture that. And that's all with paint, you know, I'm working, you know, all the prima, like on top, I'm working with color and value to get that kind of feel. And we'll talk about, you know, the theory behind this, because there has to be light that supports, you know, a textural read like this. Um, little color dodge layer. So that's where the technical does come in. And, and Adam's absolutely 100% correct. Digital does allow us to do some things that traditional wanted. We do have the ability to turn layers on and off, sandwich things in between. So we'll use it to our benefit, but it's absolutely the same theory as, you know, traditional techniques. So, so we don't run out of time here. I'll start moving through here, but you'll just notice little by little, um, just chipping things away. And there you can see, uh, I'm starting to make a big change. Um, um, now this isn't the best practice because you'll notice that I think at a certain point I flatten things down. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly go over a better <laughs> workflow than this. This was kind of a, at the end we were nearing and I thought, okay, well, I want to make a big change here. Um, you guys will certainly have better practices than I did <laughs> on this, uh, on this particular one. Um, but but I, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Got to right? do, right? Yep, yeah. bootstrap. It's the equivalent of a, a duct tape, right? Um, so I just kind of duplicated the background because um, I didn't like, there was something very, uh, you know, the, the arm here was feeling a bit too cartoony. So even as I'm moving through it, you know, really making sure that it doesn't feel like the, the, the piece is driving me, but I'm driving the piece. So if things need changing, you got to change them. Uh, so redoing that, I believe um, this is where I started bringing some more photo textural elements because, you know, nature's the best designer. So there I'm using a snapping turtle uh, mouth and throat, which is one of the gnarliest looking things, right? Crazy. Yeah. Right? Is it yeah. nuts? I mean, that's a creature mouth, right? So I just, I plastered mm -hmm. on there, threw some extra paint in there just to change it, just to make what I call the other, you know, shifting it over a little bit. Um, you know, some value changes. We'll, we'll go over all that technical just a little bit more paint here and there, you know, fleshing out, bringing some, because this, um, you'll notice this rib cage very smooth right here. It's not matching quite the form language we have. So I do embellish that silhouette a little bit more, accent some of these, you know, elements of the silhouette, and then boom, bringing that other arm back in. So changing the angle up there, making sure proportions feel a little bit better. I could probably still 
work on this hand. Um, and then, of course, we bring it uh, here. So uh, just, you know, we bring this up and start just kind of plussing up the lighting a little bit more. So just, you know, kind of reiterating that sort of key light falling across our creature. A few more proportional changes. And then we move to finish things finish, excuse me, finish things up. So, you know, at this point, it's kind of a copy merge. I start to flatten, uh, you know, cool tool inside of Photoshop is the liquify tool. So you can see I start to make some proportional changes, making sure that kind of leg muscle, quote unquote, feels a little bit, uh, you know, thicker because here we're starting to kind of push it stylized where like, can these limbs actually support this weight? Um, so I start to make some changes, some color corrections, um, a little more color dodge, a little spruce up that subsurface scattering. Um, cause one thing I do like to do every once in a while is, you know, you throw a black layer on there and just continue to check your values. Cause here again, that's one of those things that has to, has to work on its own. You know, even if I was to turn in a black and white image, it has to read here because the color is, it's one of those supplemental things that's, you know, it's a bit more subjective. So these things are going to be objectively correct or incorrect. So I'll constantly check that. So you can see, I can quickly turn that on and off. And then, uh, you know, final presentation, which is essentially, um, we'll go here, uh, just kind of cropping in, maybe a few color adjustments more, and we'll go over all that stuff. I call that cherry on the top kind of stuff. It's when your piece is in a good place and you can have fun doing some of the post-processing for presentation. And of course, you know, Adam and I, we're, we're big fans of kind of the graphic read. So I like to put like, you know, just simple vignettes or something in the background, nothing to detract from the creature, but to just put it in a slight setting. And then um, is this anything? Nope. Nothing. Uh, oh, this was just an action line. So this is just a few things I draw through, you know, just kind of show, uh, you know, how we're just thinking about this form and perspective. But uh, yeah, that's ultimately it. I know we kind of went through that at a breakneck speed. Do not worry, guys. This is weeks worth of work in the class. It's so we take it. Like step Ten weeks step. worth of information. Um, and yeah. And again, um, what, what I love about what you've just done here, Kyle, and why I think it's so important to put it on a stream like this is you talk about the cherry on top stuff at the end. And there's so many tutorials on YouTube floating around where people are dealing more with the cherry on top, yep. right? They're focusing on that. And so, you know, if, if you're out there, you know, and, and maybe you're, you're using some Photoshop or using Procreate on the iPad or some sort of a digital painting application, we get really excited about things like Color Dodge because it does something cool, but yep. you gotta know why you're using it. So like Kyle mentioned that, like, you know, the light goes through and under the skin. Skin is slightly translucent, so it's a great tool for that. So I don't wanna belabor the point, but really what I appreciate about what you spent more time on is the foundational stuff. And that's a thing that I think um, can be easily missed. And I think that's the thing that, you know, people who are maybe not yet coming to know them and maybe they're still in high school, you can focus on that stuff. And even the the, the point of where you started to render out and draw those lines and give some form to it, that's all, those are all techniques you can learn in pencil in art school, or I mean, in a, in a high school art class. Absolutely. And so, you know, all of that translates guys. And I think that's, that's really one of the things I was excited about getting across today with you, Kyle, um, is that I wish, you know, when I was first starting to jump into digital painting back in the day, I wish someone would have broken that down for me and validated all of the, like just drawn in pencil in my sketchbook and all that stuff. Absolutely, I'm, and then that's the same thing. And it's nothing against those early tutorials, but like, I, I think I told you in person, like, you know, everything I would see was like, well then just do this, multiply layer, this, this, this. I was like, well, now to me, it's all about knowing when to press the right button right. versus what am I doing to just come with the creature? So ultimately it's like, you know, if I felt a piece was successful, it was only because it was matching the artist's that I was following, but I ended up with a piece that looked just like theirs. And I, and I will say this, this is a huge positive effect in the class is that everyone, everyone's work looks different. The goal for, uh, you know, uh, the goal for me, for you guys, for class is, is not to do what I do. It's not to replicate my shapes. It's to do your own thing, but that I just give you guys the tools to execute on those ideas. So yeah, thanks. I mean, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's absolutely yeah, that it. It helps so much, man. Um, and, uh, you know, the cool thing now is like, this will be floating around the internet too. Like it'll be on the, on the YouTube or, or the Twitch channel for Noman. Um, you know, and I'd love it if, uh, if more artists, you know, who are interested in this could get, could get a chance to see this, um, and realize like, no, 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 it's building blocks and you can learn the building blocks. Um, 
So I, you know, we've had so much fun. We're almost, we're already starting to come up to an hour and a half. I want to be respectful of your time, Kyle. Uh, do you have a little bit of time to stick around and answer some yeah. questions from the chat? Absolutely. Okay. Thrilled. Awesome. Um, but yeah, this has been really, really great. Um, it will be recorded, guys. So if you want to go back and look at some of those other steps that Kyle was talking about, definitely do it. Um, and you know, as as we progress and, and more layers get stacked on, just remember, you know, this this isn't a tutorial on how to do all that. It's an example showing that over the course of ten weeks in a classroom, you can learn this stuff in sequence. So it's not about just sort of being that artist that can just draw it out of their head immediately and start at the cherry on top level. Like you got to learn it and how, learn how to build it up. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, let's jump into some of the questions my colleague Xander's been, been passing on. And, and uh, you know, maybe some of these we've already answered in, in context of, uh, of the stream already, but I'll, I'll try to pick out the ones uh, that look like we need to address. Okay, let's see here. All right. All right. Um, well, I just I see one question real quick from uh, Mellow Snarls. What program software do you use, and is there a way I can start learning how to use them? Um, I think I'll just really quickly address that one myself. Yep. Um, Kyle mentioned some of the stuff from Photoshop to ZBrush, um, and a way you can start learning how to use them is uh, you can definitely check out things dealing that are sp software specific. But I also would say that you know uh, taking an individual class on Noma is going to allow you to learn uh, the software in context of learning the art like we've just unpacked here. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, here, here's someone that said, uh, I took your intro to ZBrush class last year. Um, how would you say that COVID has impacted your teaching style? Has it become more challenging? So a little sympathetic to the instructor here. So yeah, oh, thank you. I wonder who that was. Yes, because what they're referencing is uh, the digital sculpting course, which um, James Schauf and a few, a few other instructors yeah. now teach and stuff and do a brilliant job at. So I, I kind of moved over where they, they needed me. But I, I had a wonderful time teaching that because I felt like I could give back the things that that I felt helped me the most learn ZBrush. Um, uh, with impact, you know, here again, I'll, I'll toot Nor a Noman's uh, uh, horn. Uh, they didn't skip a beat. So for me, it was it was plug and play. And in fact, there's a few extra features added to the online model, uh, like the discussion board that I actually I'm going to I'm going to talk to the office because uh, the office because I'm even when we're back in person. That's something I would love to see continue, that we basically have this little sandbox we can play in from week to week. And I'm sure they go, I don't want to I don't want to hear from Kyle until next Tuesday, you know, or next Wednesday when classes. But it's a great place where we can just meet and have conversations so you don't feel like you're burning a whole week to get an answer. Sure, you can email me and stuff, but it's a great way not only to hear from me, but from your fellow classmates, because I do try and treat it like a studio atmosphere. Uh, no, but it's it's been great. And, and I think jumping on webcams and seeing everyone's face and stuff. Yeah, we're not in person. So. Um, you know, other than a few technical things, I would say we, we uh, you know, um, I can't speak for everyone and hopefully the experience is, I, I believe it's been the same for the students. I know for me as an instructor, I, I feel uh, right at home. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to getting back on campus. Uh, but with with the way things have been, I'm, I'm really fortunate this was one of those things that didn't change. Yeah, no, and and uh, it's the online class I've taken, they actually want to be really collaborative. And I yeah. love not only hearing from you, but also from from the peers in the class. Um, let's see, uh, Salibi, uh, <laughs> Sibylla Pepiart, love these chat names. Um, hi, Kyle, do you have any advice for a creature enthusiast who wants to push their designs? Push their designs, ooh, that's a good one. Um, I would say getting more comfortable with obviously that iterative process at the beginning, the thumbnail stage. Uh, do not commit to a design too early on because that's where the muscle memory comes from. We ended up being, we're, we're far too conservative at that point when we go right into it. And yeah. I can speak from experience. I've been on shows where the time is limited and we're forced to just go. Um, you know, I'm sure the client wouldn't be thrilled to hear this right now, but I'll be very candid with you guys is that it forces you into a place where you're comfortable. And you go, okay, well, if I have to produce, I'm just going to go. And, and, you know, and through experience, you know, and then it kind of forced me to go, well, if I'm going to be quick, I also have to be able to look at reference real quick and come up with some new shapes. Um, you know, obviously time is a benefit there. So if you have more time, we can explore more shapes. But I would say you guys saw my, you know, the thumbnail uh, stage, if, if I could here, you know, the, the thumbnails. Uh, if that's uh, on, let's see here. Uh, these guys right here. Uh, Th this is this is these are non-committal. They take a thirty seconds a piece, if not less, to just see if something is working graphically that can help me push my designs. So I would encourage you guys to do that. And of course, reference, 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 reference. Yep. 
Um, and then uh, let's see, Mellow Snarls is back. Um, and I'm just gonna address this really quickly. And I think my, my colleague Xander has as well. Um, is a student actually at uh, Orange County School of the Arts? That's awesome. I'm actually yeah. gonna be at your guys' college fair in a couple hours. So maybe. Oh, there there. You go. Um, but um, they're asking for some advice on portfolios uh, for submitting to Nomen. Um, I know you probably heard from Xander, but I'd say for everybody else in the chat, just really quickly, um, you know, no two portfolios are the same. And the most important thing is we want to see your creativity, your ideas. We want to see it presented well and considerately. Uh, we want to see a completed projects, you know, so not just a bunch of sketches, but like something that's brought, been brought to completion. And we also want to see your technical skill, you know, so if you're doing a, a character, like the kind of stuff that Kyle showed us here, like you paying attention to anatomy. Um, whether it's a creature or character. But with that said, I would say if you, if you go to our Twitch uh, channel um, you are, and or to, to YouTube, you're going to be able to find a past stream called Portfolio Tips and Tricks. And that is going to be a stream with exactly the person you need to hear from, um, Hannah Webb, our uh, Director of Admissions. She unpacks um, in depth what you're going to want to think about when you're putting together a portfolio to come to Noman. So definitely go check that out, Portfolio Tips and Tricks. Um, watch that one. Um, let's see here. Danny Amber is asking, hi, Kyle, do you have any tips for aspiring creature artists who may struggle with artist block while working on creature concepts or sculptures? Um, also, would you have any words of advice for a student who constantly doubts their artwork and feels um, like imposter syndrome all the time? So kind of, you know, getting getting through the block as well as, you know, that thing that I think all of us face, which is like, I don't think I'm really good enough. Yep. Well, twofold. Well, thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's twofold. So I'll, I'll touch on the imposter syndrome first. I wish I could tell you guys it goes away. It doesn't. <laughs> Every day I feel like I got to justify, you know, being there and really prove, you know, what I'm capable of, prove to my peers that I'm there to, to play ball with them and to, to match the level. The biggest thing is just remembering, you know, it's it competitive in a good way. A raising tide raises all ships. So if you feel like someone's, you know, excelling at something, figure out how they do, inquire about how they're doing it. You know, there is no secret sauce. So it's all about kind of sharing this knowledge with one another to propel your work forward. Uh, if you feel like you have artist block, so what I recommend to that is, you know, getting into a commercial field, you have to get to a place where you just have to produce. Now, unfortunately, art is tied to emotion. It's tied to how you slept that night. It, you know, what inspired you, you know, what you ate. <laughs> if you're feeling sluggish after lunch, you know, these are problems you have faced, you know, no, no disrespect to, you, you know, uh, those in fields where you, you, you crunch numbers and stuff or things that, you know, ones and zeros for us, they are subjective decisions. You make every pen stroke, you have to put a thought behind. That's why it's so exhausting at the end of the day. You go, well, I wasn't lifting heavy boxes or doing manual labor, but it's, it's, it's intense, right? Because you're putting a lot of brain power behind every single brush stroke, every key, you know, uh, swipe that you're, you're hitting on, on the keyboard. So I would say with artist block to me, it, it's that thumbnail process. It's that thing. It's being non-committal with that. It's just putting pen to paper. The best thing you can do. And I've seen artists, you know, when they're first starting a painting on a canvas, they'll just boom, 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 hit a bunch of lines, you know, down on it just to start making something because there's more, nothing more daunting than the white canvas. Hell, something as easy as just throwing down a mid gray value across your background is enough where you're not looking at a stark white environment, staring into the void and say, Oh my God, what do, you know, what do I do next? So, um, and then, like I said, just the reference or just shapes, but just start doodling. It's almost like you just have to start producing because unfortunately working commercially, you don't have the benefit of inspiration. You can't just sit around all day sipping coffee until something strikes. Time is money. So we have to, you just have to produce. So it's just a matter of just saying, whenever I've been stuck on a project, talk it out, take a break for a few minutes. That's the biggest thing. Get up from your computer or your drawing pad, take a walk or something and come back to it with fresh eyes because you end up burning more time and, and energy trying to force it to work rather than just taking a few minutes, take a breath, come back and, um, you know, and, and then just pen to paper. Oh, that's really good. Um, we've got a question from uh, Marcio AV that I'll just, I'll touch on real quickly because I think, um, it's a pretty in-depth question, but right now I'm in a dilemma. I'm trying to decide if uh, specializing in 3D modeling for characters and assets for films or take a specialty in VFX production. I really love both areas, but I think maybe I should choose only one area. Do you have some advice for me? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna move through that question a, a little quickly just by saying, um, I would strongly suggest having a conversation with one of our admissions advisors at Noman. Um, I don't know if you're already a student at Noman, you're asking about that. Um, I do know that Noman teaches the entire pipeline in our full-time program. So you're going to get you're going to get both of those skill sets and then decide what you want to focus on. Um, but if if you're if you're not at Noman, 
Um, our admissions advisors are available really to be coaches. You know, it's it, your first conversation with them is not going to be about, you know, signing the dotted line and applying to the school. It's going to be about your art, your goals, what you're looking for. And they'll even be able to offer some advice about, you know, those arenas and what you maybe maybe what you want to focus on first um, and how, you know, Noman has uh, classes and courses that, that are available to help with that. Um, going to jump forward to uh, Diego Jose. Um, and he is saying, how long and what are the chances of a person being hired to work in companies potentially in the area? If you were to start again, what would you do? Okay. So I think someone looking to start working, you know, maybe here in LA, um, mm -hmm. if you went back, talk to your younger self, getting ready to jump out there and work, is there any advice that you'd give? Ooh, um, you know, I, I, I felt, um, you know, for me, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, maybe focusing on more of the, the 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 technical things or just rounding out some of the CG work. But you know, here again, I've learned a lot on the on the job too, which is another education. It's just learning how to communicate and learning the language so that I can have those dialogues with the rest of the pipeline. You know, and it's great because it's all one process. You're not. It's not these individual stair steps. I mean, it's just one fluid line throughout. So it's really best to have that conversation. But a younger self, um, you you know, I would say just if I could just saying working on these foundational skills a little bit earlier, just sharpening those up and stuff, but into just relinquishing the fear, just getting out there and, and, and producing. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, is when I jumped into Photoshop and stuff, just do it, create, it doesn't have to be a masterpiece. It's just putting here again, just pen to paper and, and just making stuff. So hopefully that answers the question, but. Yeah. Uh, we've got another viewer uh, by the name of uh, Vikram Sharma asking, hello, Kyle, what are your portfolio suggestions to a 30 year old um, starting fresh as a modeling artist? Oh, sure. Vikram. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of modeling and stuff, I mean, I, I always recommend try to find an artist that, um, uh, you know, sort of in line with that specific goal, but just as a general sense or, you know, for a generalist, um, you know, clear and concise in terms of the direction that you want to go, letting, you know, the potential company or hiree or, you know, client know um, what you like to work on focus. I think there's a propensity that uh, propensity towards artists feeling like they have to have everything. Um, you know, it, obviously you want to show your versatility, but it's the same thing that goes down to these foundational skills. You know, you can look at a clean model and just by showing a couple of examples of say some hard surface modeling versus organic modeling and sculpting, you, you can see the skill. Anyone with that eye will say, well, even if Vikram, like I know he just did a walkie talkie, but if I throw him a mech, he's probably gonna handle it in a very similar fashion or same thing with the you know beautiful character designs. Like, hey, with some tweak proportions, we've got ourselves a really beautiful orc or, you know, or, or something. So, um, you know, I would say, but you still wanna show focus in, you know, and find that right fit for you. So. Um, it, you know, it always depends. And I always encourage people and, and students to talk to as many professionals as possible because I have one view on it or one opinion. You know, it's like a Venn diagram. You just want to see where most of the uh, input overlaps. And that's usually good because I've heard different theories on what you should have in your portfolio. But for me, you know, I wanted to get into character creatures. So that's what I filled my portfolio with. And that's where I was fortunate to get that gig. Yeah, doing. Um, so we've got another question here, uh, a little bit more technical. Um, hi, Kyle. What software uh, do you use for texturing? And also, can we make photo photorealistic texture just by using ZBrush's polypaint? Oh, uh, yes. So for the technical side of things, um, because time is of the essence, we when we're rendering... When, okay, so let's talk about the 3D to uh, the 3D for concept pipeline. Yes, polypaint out ZBrush. Like if you can do that and treat it like the way that the practical guys did in the heyday, the golden age of you know the '80s and early uh, early '90s of airbrushing creature effects and stuff. Um, basically, the same theories apply inside of ZBrush, which is fantastic. You basically, airbrush your model, bring it into KeyShot. Um, and I only mention KeyShot because it's drag and drop. It's an efficiency thing. Obviously, you can get beautiful renders, you know, inside of uh, Cycles and Blender, or, you know, if you're using Octane or V-Ray, you can certainly go that route. But you have to remember for design, you can't spend a bunch of time setting up a production model. So it is about the efficiency. Um, so absolutely, you can you can bring in textures. They've made it so much easier now with some of the tools inside of ZBrush that allow you to, you know, flatten your model if it's got a UV and paint on top of it, take those textures elsewhere, paint, bring them back in. Um, I use a very simple technique inside KeyShot where I don't even have uh, UVs on my model and you can just drag and drop a flat texture on it to get it to, to wrap around, which is nice. So, you know, if it's the animal textures, uh, you know, wrinkles and stuff, you still have to think about where they're placed and where they fall. So it's not always applicable, but for that sort of tertiary detail, like, 
you know, little variations in the skin texture, just a little breakup. It's very, it, it's simple enough to do. But then as it relates to my class, yes, we do definitely talk about bringing photo textures in, how to map it to the lighting and a form and uh, go through those principles. So uh, yeah, so regardless of whether it's the 3D side of things or more the 2D uh, uh, textures or in terms of the 2D design textures we talk about in class, um, they're, they're both rather simple workflows. So yeah. And I'll, I'll say too, like, um, you know, taking Kyle's creature design class, which is going to focus more on 2D design of creatures, uh, the design sensibility. Um, a great follow-up to that class is to jump into Jared Krzyzewski's Sculpting Creatures class in yep. Z. And 100%. Jared gets into a lot of that, like with the poly paint, how to pay attention to your textures and your wrinkles, get the best results. Um, and Jared's fairly render agnostic, meaning that he's not going to say it has to be this or it has to be that. He's going to teach you skills. They're going to let you bring it into whatever kind of workflow you're planning on using it in. Um, all right. So let's see 100%. here. Uh, we just got somebody asking, is it true that Kyle's biggest influence is Prometheus and Alien Covenant? I heard that. Is that interesting? So is that Matt Millard? Or um, I'm wondering if that's Jared Krzyzewski in this. Yeah. Uh, no comment. So I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, so it's been but some sort of an inside thing there, guys. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so um, thanks, guys. Let's see here. Uh, Renato Sari is asking, "Hello, any advice for an artist who has been undertaking the world of 3D for a few years and wants to improve as a 3D artist and live abroad?" Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, can't speak to working internationally. I know that definitely markets, and of course, in light of everything going on with COVID that's been a big conversation is, Hey, can I, do I have to live in LA, you know, LA County? Can I, you know, can I be elsewhere and stuff? I mean, we're still figuring that out. So it's tough to kind of speak to that, but I know every country has their markets or their demands for, you know, uh, CG artists and stuff, but boy, I wish I could, I could speak to that. What I would recommend is, you know, finding other international artists and stuff that are LA based or their experience. Cause like even my buddy, David, um, you know, he's from Spain. He was back there doing some work. He's now he's in Australia on a, on a production and stuff. So, I mean, there's certainly versatility, but you know, part of it is, well, where, where, where are the jobs that you want to do? You know, if your dream is to be at Blizzard, well then, you know, living in Irvine is probably going to be the thing you, you, you know, you, you probably want to aim towards. It just, it helps eliminate some of the variables or, you know, the, the, um, uh, you, you know, the door to entry that might get in your way being international. That's the only thing, but I wish I could speak to that more, but there are of course tons of Noman students and stuff going through that, you know, right now. So. Um, I want to mention that if, uh, just for the sake of time, I've seen a few questions come in that have to do with, you know, when you're drawing something that doesn't exist, how to, you know, uh, how do you, how do you find reference and that sort of thing. I, I would, I don't know if you saw this already, but I would suggest um, in the recording of this stream, go back and look at the very early steps in this creature that Kyle's got up here because he talks about grabbing references and then pulling the the foundational shapes from, from those creatures and kind of building out your stick figure and your anatomy from there. But it, it Kyle does impact the relationship between references that you know don't look like what you're making, but are gonna help you make it look believable. Yep. Um, and then uh, let's see, we've just got a, just a few more to hit up here. Sure. Um, let's see, uh, Tomical is asking, how do you work to, po oh, that was one of the ones that I just addressed. Uh, Dragon Art 7 I've been told my character designs are good enough to get me hired. However, my passion is creature design and not characters. Uh, should I focus on doing creature design so that I will be hired for that? Or should I include character art even though I won't enjoy it as much? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just it's 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 just another aspect of design. So if you want to pivot and you want to play, you know, it's it, you know, use analogy. It's like if you know you're a much better third baseman than a you know first baseman and and stuff, and that's where your passion is. Well, then it's like it's still it's still baseball. It's still the same game. So I just feel like you know, design is design. So show them a portfolio of of creature designs. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have some of those extra elements that are more character specific, um, just so a client can potentially see the versatility, but any studio or, you know, uh, art director that's doing the hiring, they can, like, I, as I mentioned before, I think it was on Vikram's, well, like, uh, you know, as it relates to any aspect of this pipeline, it's like the, the technique is the technique, right? So regardless of whether you're doing the, 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 the character um, or, or creature, you know, it's like those principles still hold true. Now, 
if you want to do creature, you absolutely show the kind of creature technique. Because if there's like a crazy pivot and you only do like fantastical and stuff, then you know they might say, well, your characters look photoreal. Like, yes, you could work here in Naughty Dog, but then the creatures pivot a little too much. So they have a hard time kind of tracking down your style or where you kind of want to live work-wise. Um, that might get a little bit trickier, but I think your portfolio should always reflect where your passions lie. It doesn't make, you know, that to me, it wouldn't make any sense for you to you feel like it's a drag every day doing something that you don't want to do. You, you can always hold out for that job you, you do want. Um, and, I, and I don't want to sound like a broken record here or that I'm just giving a plug, but I, I will say um, as a person who had more experience and mileage on uh, designing for character than creature, when I jumped into Kyle's creature design class at Gnome and it really helped me um, take a lot of the stuff that I had learned, the sensibilities that I had both for drawing, but also for rendering and doing characters and to bring that into a creature design. So I think even just taking a really good course like that might help you level up your creature designs and learn from what you already know. Um, that seems to be getting yep. great feedback in your character work. And then, you know, I like, I remember the, the, one of the briefs we got in your class, Kyle, it was like it's going to be a creature, but it was like this sci-fi, sci-fi guy. So mm -hmm. there's also realms where, like you taught us, character and creature can overlap too. Yep. You know, it's a lot absolutely, to absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, that's I'd, I'd say it's about all the time we got today, guys. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you were late to the stream, definitely go back and watch some of the beginning stuff. We spent some time early on talking with Kyle about his journey, talking about some of the projects he's he's been able to work on. And then what we're looking at right here is he actually walked us through and broke down a uh, creature design that he did in Photoshop and kind of explained it layer by layer. So really invaluable information. Um, Kyle, I also want to thank you so much for your time. Today. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, it was a pleasure, dude. Pleasure. As always, love talking with you and love talking with everyone. Can I, can I, can I throw something up here real quick, sir? I know we talked about this. Yeah. Um, I don't make any money from this. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> uh, but this was a book I was very fortunate to be a part of. It's called The Fundamentals of Creature Design. I mean, the artists in here are staggering. You have Bryn Matheny and, and, um, and, uh, uh, who else uh, here? A bunch of the forward by Ben Morrow and stuff. I only bring this up because this is kind of a continuation or sort of, you can imagine this is your college textbook for what we talk about in class. In fact, the chapter I talk about or that I was responsible for are those 2D design principles. So it was really fortuitous that this came out um, at a very similar time. So uh, that's um, from 3D uh, Total Publishing. It's on Amazon and stuff. It's by no means required for the class. I, I want to I, I want to put that out there. I don't make anyone buy anything like that. Um, and I don't make a dime <laughs> from the book. But um, just in terms of like resources and 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 out there and for those interested in getting a creature design, it's the it's the college textbook I wish I had. So I was just mm. lucky to be a part of it. But even if I wasn't, I would I would own this book for sure. So very cool. Yeah. But thank, thank you, Adam. Yeah. Th thank definitely. you. Definitely. Yeah. And then we're going to, if, uh, if we could get my screen share back up on the, st the stream, I want to close by letting you guys know something. We get, we get something really cool coming up. So if you've enjoyed hanging out with Kyle, um, if you enjoyed hanging out with Jared Morantz last week, um, if you saw one of our earlier streams with Jared Krzyzewski, also a very accomplished creature artist, we are going to be having um, four fantastic creature artists coming on our stream uh, on the 29th of October. Uh, you guys are getting the exclusive announcement right now. These social media posts will be going out later today, but that's going to be at 7.30 p.m. on October 29th. In in honor of Halloween, we're bringing Woo! four incredible creature artists. They're all going to be jamming together um, on the screen, uh, drawing creatures. It's going to be a hang. We're going to talk. We're going to get to look at these guys, do what they do. It's going to be a lot of fun. So um, if you're not already, follow us on social media so you can get more updates about that and future streams that we're having. Uh, I want to thank, uh, once again, Kyle. I want to thank my uh, my colleague, uh, Xander, um, for being in the chat, answering questions. Um, if you want to get in touch with Noman, uh, Xander is going to let you know how you can do that because our admissions advisors want to be available to coach you and answer questions. And uh, thanks also to Miranda for um, producing the stream today and making everything run so smoothly for us. Uh, so once again, guys, my name is Adam Hartel. I hope to see you back here on the Noman stream. And in the meantime, be safe and stay creative. We'll see you soon.